God, we become an awesome temple of God and the anointing of God upon us together, as I say, as we gather together unto Jesus, who is our foundation stone and our capstone. We experience the, the full glory of God. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being your body, your church, your temple. Together, Lord, we are here to honor you, to worship you, to give you the love and the praise of our hearts. We thank you that you promise that as we gather together in your name, you come into our midst in a special way and you reveal your glory. Thank you, Lord that where two or more are gathered in your name. Whatever you ask, Lord, whatever we ask, you will do, Lord. Thank you, God, for hearing every heart cry, even as we worship you now. Hear the cries of our hearts. And Lord, thank you that you are quick to answer. And thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. Lord, thank you. We give you this next couple of hours. Lord, may, may they be life-changing through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Good morning, family. Good morning, you all doing well? You know, as we sing this first song, I just want to encourage all of us to count our blessings, as it were. God is so good to us, amen, and he has done great things. So as we all stand up right now, I just want to encourage us, you know, let's just fix our eyes upon trees and just say, Lord, we are so grateful for your mercy and your grace. And just give him thanks this morning. come before you today and there's just one thing that I want to say thank you Lord thank you Lord for all you've given to me for the blessings that I cannot see. Oh, thank you, Lord. I want to say thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched song, I will bless your name. Thank you, Lord. God, I just want to thank you, Lord. We sing thank you, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've done in my life You took my darkness and gave me your light Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord You took my sin and my shame you took my sickness and healed all my pain We sing thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord Sing for all you've given to me For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I cannot see Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took, 
You took my sin and my shame You took my sickness and healed all my pain Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord With a grateful heart With a grateful heart, oh With a song of praise with an outstretched arm, oh, I will bless you with singing. Thank you, Lord. God, I just want to thank you, Lord. Singing, thank you, Lord. God, I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Singing, thank you, Lord. God, I just want to thank you, Lord. Sing, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we want to say thank you, Lord. For your mercies, for your endless grace Lord, you took my sin and my shame Lord, you took my sickness and healed all my pain Oh, so I just want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord With a grateful heart, with a grateful heart with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless you with a grateful heart, with a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, oh, I will bless you on, with singing, thank you, Lord, God, I just want to thank you, Lord, for thank God, I just want to thank you, Lord. We're singing thank you, Lord. God, I just want to thank you, Lord. Sing thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Yes, we praise you, Jesus. Lord, we give thanks. <laughs> we give thanks in the confidence that we can say, even though we are weak, we can say we are strong because of who you are, Lord Jesus. Even though we are poor, we can say we are rich because of what you've done for us, Lord. Because of what you've done for us. As the word says in Psalm 24, open up ancient doors, open up ancient gates, and let the king of glory enter in. King Jesus, we open up our hearts as we open up those gates right now. Enter into this place and be enthroned in our praises. Because more than anything, Lord, we are here to seek your face. We're here to bless your name. We're here to draw closer to you. We're here to honor you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, there's no other name but the name of Jesus. So we will praise the name of Jesus this morning. Because you deserve all the glory, God. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, oh nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. 
your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is for nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus you didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down oh my sin was great your love was greater so all could separate us now what a wonderful name it is oh what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a wonderful name it is for nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus oh Lord oh what a wonderful name it is oh but death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silence the boast of sin and grace the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory before you are raised to life again lord you have no rival you have no
So we lift up the name of Jesus Over sickness, over shame, over disease, over pain Oh Lord, we lift up your name, Jesus Cause you are greater, Lord You are stronger than sickness You are stronger than pain Lord, you are stronger than failure God, you are greater than any mountain that we can face For there is no name but the name of Jesus So as we call upon the name of Jesus We can take confidence in the knowledge that he will save He will rescue those who call upon his name For there is no name greater than the mighty name of Jesus There is no name stronger than the name of Jesus So call upon the name of Jesus Call upon his name and I promise you I promise you, you will be saved He will not disappoint He will not fail you He will not let you down You sing What a powerful name it is What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a powerful name it is For nothing can stand against Oh, what a powerful name it is, the name. Let's sing that again. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is. Oh, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. Oh, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, there is no other name but Jesus. Oh, we sing, we cry out. To Jesus over every situation, we sing the name of Jesus. Jesus, what a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, oh, Lord, Jesus. You never disappoint. You never disappoint, Lord Jesus. So right now, this morning, oh Lord, Father, we let go of control. We relinquish the control of this morning, the balance of this morning into your hands. This service, this time of worship belongs to you, Lord. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our mind, our soul, and our strength, Lord God. Come and have your way. Yes, enter into our hearts, enter in through these gates and have your way, Lord Jesus. Those three words are our prayer this morning. Have your way, have your way this morning. Have your way in our personal lives. Have your way in tomorrow, Lord, and whatever tomorrow brings. Have your way in our jobs. Have your way in our schools. Have your way in, have your way in everything we do, Father God, for pleasure. Have your way. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Jesus, have your way. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, I'm desperate for you. Desperate for you, so I surrender. So drench my soul. Mercy and grace, 
and fools I hunger and thirst I hunger and thirst With arms fresh white I know you hear my cry Speak to me now Lord speak to me
Hallelujah. 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 Let's just love on him for a moment longer. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we honor you today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your name, which is higher than every other name. And you've given us that name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the helper, the comforter, the one who leads us into all the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The one who quickens our mortal bodies. The same one who raised you from the dead, who raises us to life. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for that fountain, that fountain of living water. Oh, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you today. We thank you for your blood, your blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Oh, Lord, thank you for that blood that speaks life, that blood that speaks forgiveness, that blood that speaks peace. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for those stripes. Thank you for your stripes by which we are healed, by which we are made whole, by which we are made the righteousness of God in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You're worthy to be praised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the cross where our sins were taken away. Hallelujah. Where our sins were removed far from us. Where we who were strangers, aliens without a covenant, were made children of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your Father's house where you have prepared a place for us. Thank you, Lord, for your Father's house where you've made room for every one of us so that where you are, we may be also. Oh, forever and evermore. Thank you, Lord, that it's free. Thank you, Lord, we don't have to pay a penny. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to work. We don't have to toil. We don't have to sweat. Thank you, Lord, it's free. Thank you, Lord, it's grace. Thank you, Lord, it's mercy. Thank you, Lord, it's favor. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's room enough for everyone. Thank you, Lord. There's room enough for everyone. Hallelujah. There's no stain that the blood cannot wash clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness. Greater your mercies new every morning. And we say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord, this morning. We say yes, Lord, this morning. Hallelujah. 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 More than conquerors because of you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Ha, ha, ha. Yes, Lord, all the way to the other side. All the way to the other side. We're going over and not under. Oh, not a single one in this place is going to sink, oh God. Hallelujah. Because you carry us. Because you take us there. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to be afraid. Because you're the good shepherd. Hallelujah. And you lift us onto your omnipotent shoulders and carry us there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you. You can be seated. We want to welcome you this morning to Oxford Bible Church. We want to especially welcome those who are watching us via live stream. Thank you for joining us in the house of God today. Praise the Lord. We want to especially welcome anybody who's with us for the very first time today. If this is your first Sunday in the house, uh, we want to give you a welcome pack. The ushers have those ready to give to you. So if that's you and you haven't received our welcome pack, just lift up your hand, please, nice and high, and the ushers will get that to you. Just keep the hand up where they can see you. Anybody who's here for the very first time, just raise your hand up nice and high. Mark, there's one hand here. Just keep your hand up, sir. Inside there, there is a, uh, there, there's a visitor's card. We'd be so grateful if you could uh, fill that out. Let us know. If you're looking for a church and you want to know some more about OBC, or maybe you're just visiting, either way, do fill out that card and uh, make sure you leave it with us. You can drop it in the offering bucket by the door or uh, give it to an usher or to pastor or to myself at the end, 
And if this is your first Sunday with us, do stay behind if you can after the service. Uh, Pastor Derek and Hillary would love to meet with you, praise God. Well, when you came in this morning, you may or may not have found something that looks like this on your seat. Uh, we were running them off in the office, and uh, that was the moment the, uh, the church printer decided it was going to stop working. So the plan was to put one of these on every single seat, but uh, we managed maybe, I don't know, half the seats or just over half the seats. So you may well have got one of these, you might not. We'll make sure that everyone gets one next week, certainly. But uh, I needed one of those grace showers last night. You ever, you ever need one of those grace showers? It's like a cold shower, but for the Spirit. In those times of frustration, when things don't quite go the way you want them to, and you can feel the, the Tabasco sauce rising, you know, that volcanic lava's coming up, and, and, uh, and you've got to get, get in the grace shower. Because his grace is made perfect in our weakness. And, and boy, was I weak when that printer stopped working. <laughs> oh, Lord, give me your grace. <laughs> because I, I planned it to go here, but now we're going over there. Hallelujah. Thank God for the grace shower. But uh, this, what this is, this is our new look, brand new uh, volunteers form. So what this does is it uh, summarizes uh, succinctly all of the various ministries in the church, all of the areas where... Uh, you might be able to be a blessing in the house and serve the Lord here. So we want to make these available to you and ask you to, to take them away and, and prayerfully consider where the Lord might want you to serve in OBC. And if he puts something on your heart, if he points you in a certain direction, be obedient and take that step of faith and uh, fill out the form. Make sure you get it back to us and uh, you can, as I said, drop it in the, the bucket here by the door, the offering bucket, or hand it to an usher, or you can give it directly to myself or Pastor Derek, but just make sure that we get it, and uh, we will connect you with uh, the relevant ministry leaders, get you on board, and uh, training, of course, in every department is available to help you uh, get into the role, but uh, we want to make these available, and, and they will every week from next week when the printer is working again, in Jesus' name. Uh, they will be in the lobby, so you'll always be able to get your hands on a form. But uh, as I said, do pray and see where God might want you to, to be a blessing in the house uh, so that, uh, you know, that the saying is many hands make light work. And, uh, and, and there's great joy in serving. There, there is great joy and satisfaction and blessing in being a blessing through serving. So uh, do make use of those forms See where the Lord might want to place you in the, in the, in the family, and uh, then uh, get those back to us. You'll see in the newsletter, Pastor Derek is back on his uh, semi-regular uh, show uh, tomorrow evening, the Q&A show. He's a regular guest on there. So tomorrow night at 10 p.m., he'll be live on the Q&A show, uh, answering the, the multitude of questions that come in from uh, from viewers there, so you can watch that on Rev TV tomorrow evening. But do also pray for him because this Wednesday he and Pastor Hillary are off to Salisbury, where Pastor Derek is going to be ministering at an all day conference uh, celebrating the feast of Pentecost. Of course, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And so Pastor Derek was uh, with this particular group uh, last year, was it for the Feast of Tabernacles last year? Uh, he was with them, so he's going back uh, to Salisbury for Celebrate Pentecost in the Garden. The group there have a, have a big garden area where they're having an outdoor meeting. So Pastor Derek will be teaching and, and blessing them with the Word of God there on Wednesday all day. So do pray for him as he goes there to do that. And uh, the fact that the pastors will be there on Wednesday means that on Wednesday evening, I'll be doing the Bible study, 7.30 on our YouTube live stream. And I'll be continuing the message on the book of Esther that I began the last time I was doing the, the Bible study a few months ago. So I hope that you can join me, 7.30, on the YouTube channel. Uh, so yesterday, I understand that the outreach team had, uh, had an outreach, open-air outreach in the town center at Bond Square, and they will be out again this Saturday between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., uh, so you're more than welcome to join them, and if you want to know more about what the outreach team does or you want to get involved in their work uh, the contact information is there in the newsletter. You can uh, contact Jason or indeed Judy. And uh, do pray for the team ahead of their ministry this Saturday. Even if you can't join them physically on the street, join them in the spirit, in prayer, and pray for them as they go out and witness to the people of Oxford. 
And uh, I understand that Judy has uh, a testimony. She's the, the leader of the team. Judy wants to share a testimony. So let me call upon Judy now. Good morning, family. Praise God. You're looking so beautiful because you're washed by the blood. You're redeemed. You are in Christ. You are the holy generation of, of God. I just want to share a quick testimony. It's really... Um, I think when Ifomina two weeks ago shared a testimony about his his testimony about his family, it reminded me of Job, you know. But I had to watch live the whole program because I think it was Scott and the whole team. Now it's so good to join in for Thursday's prayer. I would encourage the whole church every Thursday eight o'clock. Please join in for prayer. So I emailed Pete obviously for you guys to pray for me. I was in sick room, shall I say. I had, it's not migraine, it's not a headache, it's a pain at the back of my head. You could imagine the strongest needle piercing your skin or piercing through you every single day. I had that for 10 days, seriously. Now, I took the highest medication of strong painkillers that you, cocodamol, paracetamol, whatever it is, I took everything. It does not work. My husband said, uh, why didn't you call the doctor? I said, I've called the doctor in heaven. <laughs> then I said, but yeah, I know I understand, but call the you know, natural doctor. I said, okay. So I made an appointment to the doctor. I went to work. I had to take a whole week off. I took days off. I went to the doctor. They said, this is very unusual. It's only one up to three people do have this. It's not a migraine. We don't know what it is. And no tests have actually been done. I said, okay. Um, he said he's going to give me, um, um, it's a spray that you take, then you put through your nose. I said, okay. In my spirit, I'm like, really, God? I said, okay. Anyway, to cut this story short, I'm still waiting for my prescription. It's been 11 days, 10 days in pain. The 11th day I'm healed. Who, by who? The physician of all physicians. The doctors of all doctors. With no medication. With no prescription. But the prescription of heaven. The prescription of heaven is worship. The word of God. Scriptures of healing. I had all those within me every single day. My brothers and sisters, we have the physician of all physicians. We have the doctor of all doctors. When the natural doctors are even up to down waiting for the prescription, there's a prescription in heaven that's available for us. That's the word of God. Praise be to God. I'm here to testify. Glory be to God. Jesus Christ is our healer. I encourage you, whatever you're going through every single day, there is storms, there is trouble, there is challenges. Look onto the cross. I told God to show me a vision. I saw Jesus' vision. Jesus, when he was crowned, it was thorns on his head. Boom, pain on the head, the whole head. And then he was beaten, beaten, oh, pain. And then his legs, the needle, the, 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 what is it called, the nails. And then his arms. The whole body was in agony, and I'm complaining about my head. Look at the cross, the healer of all healers. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Judy, is this yours? Judy, Judy, is this yours? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Now, last week was, of course, the car wash and uh, super church and... Youth Church, the young people from those classes were outside in the sun washing your cars, and uh, I believe they raised uh, 270 pounds, which is, which is pretty impressive considering they weren't, uh, they weren't charging that much per car. But uh, I was out there with them, and they were, they were working furiously at cleaning your cars, and uh, I, I did tell them, I, I said, you know, we're going to probably make you do this again. You're, do you're doing such a good job. We should make you do this several times during the year, because that's the thing, you see, if you do a good job, we'll notice and we'll get you to do it again. But uh, I, I think that uh, either Jose or Ronald is going to come up now and just tell us a bit about what happened last week and what's also coming up around the corner, because, of course, all of these events are in aid of Jose's upcoming mission trip to, to the U.S. So whoever is coming up, 
Okay. Oh, okay. So Jose's obviously not made it here yet. He's on the way still. His spokesperson is here, though. Angel, God bless you. Good morning, family. Yes, last week we did the car wash. I just wanted to get all the young people who participated up. Can I see you? So come, on. come, come, come. Thank you. Yeah, we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated and let us wash your cars. Um, as a family, everyone give somebody a high five. We did a good job. High five? High five. High five, high five. High five. Yes, we raised 270 pounds. Woo! Yeah, we're so grateful. Um, that definitely helped towards Joseph's trip. We're all excited for him to go. Um, we just wanted to also let you know that there's a basketball tournament coming up in two weeks on Saturday. There is a QR code in the newsletter for you guys to get your tickets. Everybody is welcome. But no, we just wanted to give everybody here a round of applause because we did a good job. Pastor Derek, we didn't include these on the on the form. The the car wash ministry. I think that's that's these guys. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to amend the form and and get that on there. The OBC car wash ministry. Praise God. Well done, well done. And uh, you'll see inside the newsletter is the information about the the basketball tournament which is coming up, the All Star basketball tournament. And you can find that information inside the newsletter, where it is going to be, what uh, what's going on there, and how you can book your place. Praise God. Now, coming up in about a month's time, or just over a month, on Sunday, the 3rd of July, uh, we'll have the graduation ceremony for all the uh, children of Kinder Church, Junior Church, Super Church, and the Youth Church, who are at the upper age limit of those classes as they prepare to move on up to the next class. And, uh, of course, the graduation ceremony is one of those things that COVID uh, prevented us from having for the last couple of years. So it'll be so good to have the, the actual graduation ceremony and not just put the names of the children in the newsletter, but uh, parents of uh, all of those classes uh, whose children are at the upper age limit and preparing to move on up to the next class, uh, be advised that uh, teachers and leaders are, are going to be contacting you in the next few weeks and helping to prepare you and your children for that move. But we're looking forward for the, uh, to that graduation ceremony. And of course, uh, the 3rd of July is also International Day, something else that uh, COVID uh, got in the way of, and so it'll be nice to have, I hope you can remember how to do it, because it's been a couple of years. I'm sure we can remember, right, how to do International Day. Some, some of you who, who have joined us since about 2020 are probably thinking, what on earth are they talking about? Just you wait and see. Just you wait and see. But uh, International Day is, is going to be such a blessing. I'll have more information about that in the newsletter next Sunday, and I have a couple of people who've already approached me uh, without even being prompted in the newsletter. Uh, they've already come to me and, and told me that they want to perform, and uh, I won't look in anyone's direction, but uh, we're hoping to get lots of uh, songs and dance and uh, other performances up here on the... On Don't look in your direction. Sorry, I won't look in your direction. But uh, that's going to be a great blessing. International Day is coming up, praise God. You'll see in the newsletter also that uh, our missionary Alice has, praise God, got her visa to get back into her target country. She thanks everyone for, for praying because she's long been trying to get back on the mission field and has been for the last few months in a neighboring country, uh, unable to get back into her mission field. But she, she now has an open door. Uh, a visa has been granted to her. So she will be flying on Tuesday. Um, back to her mission field. But the visa she's got is, uh, it's currently only a 60-day visa. 
Uh, so she does ask for prayer because she's looking to extend the visa or get a new visa sometime in the middle of June. And she's asking for prayer that, uh, that she would have that favor with officials and all the correct boxes will be ticked and every I dotted, every T crossed so that she uh, can get back to that work that God has called her to on the mission field there. And I know she's chomping at the bit. So thank you for everyone who's been praying for Alice, but do continue to pray that, uh, that uh, this open door will lead to, obviously, her being able to, uh, to get back to work there on the mission field, praise God. Now, before we pray, let me just point out that, uh, yes, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, as I mentioned, and Pastor Hillary will be ministering the Word of God with a message called Pentecostal Prayer. You don't want to miss that next Sunday. I always love it when Pastor Hillary um, ministers the Word of God. I was going to say something now. I don't know if I was... Oh, okay. I've, I have permission to say it. When, when Pastor Derek teaches, you learn so much about the Word of God. Isn't that right? When Pastor Hillary teaches, you learn so much about the Word of God and the Walker household as well. <laughs> so so I, I'm really looking forward to, to Pastor Hillary ministering next week. Praise God. Hallelujah. So before we pray, I, I want to invite Susie. Is Susie here today? Susie Webb, are you here? Come on up, Susie. I know you wanted to share something about what the Lord has been showing you recently. God bless you. Good morning, lovely church family. Isn't it great to be here? It's so exciting to be in the presence of God. We, you never know what God's going to do, do we? When he's so unpredictable, he's not like us. Um, um, Pastor Hillary asked me to come and share um, what happened three weeks ago, my experience of what happened three weeks ago, just before she prayed. Um, for us about the power of God coming. Anyway, I was standing sort of at the end of this first row on this side, and um, I just felt, you know, felt the presence of God coming, and it ca sort of came from the back to the front through me, a bit like a wind, and, um, and the, you know, the presence of God was there. And at the same time, I had a, a simultaneously, I had a, a vision of lots of sparks coming out of the front of people's bodies, you know, some were as large as footballs, some were small, like foot, um, tennis balls. They were sort of like sparklers. So like little explosions coming out of the front of people's bodies. And um, at the same time, I just felt this, um, it was as if all doubts fled. All doubts fled. You know, all those things that I'd been, you know, that we've been believing for for many years. Those people to come to know the Lord, the family members, the friends, the acquaintances, the, the healings that hadn't happened yet, you know, all those things that, that we'd longed for, that we'd prayed for. In, in one moment, I suddenly found myself having that faith to believe that all those things were possible. And just it's just like um, doubt just fled. And there was a real sort of power surge of the Holy Spirit at that time. And, um, um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I felt that... Um, Sorry, I'll just get my notes out for such a time as this. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking, yeah, I remember thinking to myself, I don't actually recall that I've ever felt this full of faith before. So it was a, um, a momentary thing. And then Pastor Hillary stepped forward and gave her word. Um, so, you know, it was a wonderful thing. And also I believe that Camilla also felt the same thing. So we're on, you know, the... We've got the three witnesses here. <laughs> um, isn't it wonderful when God's presence comes? Um, so thank him for that. Also, I had a w uh, vision this morning. I saw a, a, a belt, a strong leather belt, unbuckling. And I just believe that God is here to unbuckle things in our lives. Buckles are things that hold tight, that they restrict you know, we can sort of use them to pull ourselves in and make ourselves look different. We can, they hold on things, garments that we might not want to be wearing um, in the spirit. Um, they're restricting and, and they're also, you know, they're sort of holding us back. They might be holding us back from the things of God. So I just want to pray that all those buckles in the spirit are gone um, in the power of God. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who does wondrous things. We love you. We need you. We're desperate for you. Lord, we believe that 
that you want us to be free at this time, free of every hindrance, free of every restriction, free of every garment, whether it's discouragement or, or anger or pain or whatever it is, even, even if there are shoes that need to be unbuckled, shoes, big heavy shoes that need to be unbuckled because there are, there are sandals of peace underneath. Lord, we want to walk in peace. Lord, we pray that all those buckles would be unbuckled that, that in the spirit that, that shouldn't be there and that are holding us back and hiding us from your presence. Lord, we want to be those who are undone in your presence. For there's, there's nothing more wonderful than being in your presence, oh God. So Lord, we thank you for doing that this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Worship team, do you want to come and, and get ready for the, the offering song? We're just about to pray. And uh, as we pray, I just want to thank, of course, again, everyone who does give uh, into the ministry of OBC. However it is you might give, whether it's through the offering bucket by the door or the various means uh, by bank transfer or through the online PayPal system. However it is you give, uh, we're ever so grateful. And uh, if you're wondering all the different, what, what all the different ways are to give, uh, that information is, of course, on our website also biblechurch.co.uk. Just hit the donate tab and uh, all the information will be there. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your, your wonderful plan that you involve and include us in. Thank you, Lord, that you have a, a calling and a purpose for each and every one of us. Lord, I just pray that you would, you would help us to walk in the fullness of what you're calling us to. And Lord, I want to lift up the, the outreach team to you and, and thank you for the work that they do. Lord, may you just bless each and every single one ahead of their ministry this Saturday. May they all be rested and refreshed and ready to go on Saturday. May the Spirit of God fall upon them in great fire and power as they minister the Word of God. May you draw the hungry and the hurting and the lost to them there on the streets in Bond Square and that surrounding area. Give them a word in season to speak the word of God by the power, by the unction of the Holy Spirit. That, Lord, seeds would be planted, that lives would be transformed, that, that souls would be saved on Saturday. Lord, we just give you the thanks and praise that you protect and guard and surround with holy angels, that team as they minister on the street. Keep them from evil, from all the devices of the evil one. And may they see your glory in the midst of them as they minister in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Jose. I've just heard that he's booked his flight for the 16th of June. He's ready to go out there to the USA. Lord, may that same spirit, that spirit to evangelize, to minister, preach the gospel, be upon him as he travels to the USA. May you do great and mighty things through him in that land. Lord, that you would use him for your glory, that Thank you, Father, that every need he has is met in you. And Lord, as he looks to you and, and travels out there to do your will, thank you, Lord, that you do miracles, miracles and transform lives. I thank you, Lord, that there are young lives in the USA. They don't know what is about to hit them, not because of Jose, but because of who lives in him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that, that wonderful opportunity that you've given him to be a blessing in that land. May you take him there safely and bring him back to us safely. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And Lord, we remember Alice at this time. We thank you for granting her that 60-day visa that gets her back into the, the country of her mission field. Now, Lord, we just ask that you would continue to pour out grace and favor upon her. Give her favor, Lord, as she prepares to extend that visa. Give her favor because, Lord, you've called her to the work out there. You've called her to fulfill that, uh, that plan and purpose for her life in that land. So, Lord, Lord, we just ask that you would intervene, that you would touch the hearts of every official, everyone who has to rub a stamp, every bureaucrat, every box ticker. Lord, we just ask that you would touch the hearts of each and every one of them so that her visa would be swiftly granted to remain in that country and do that which you've called her to do. We thank you, Lord, for just giving her peace, peace of mind, peace in her heart that passes understanding that she wouldn't be anxious at all as she goes back to that mission field. We just thank you for her life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we remember all the young people in OBC 
during this exam season, Lord, all those who are preparing for exams right now, GCSEs and A-levels, Lord, that your spirit would be upon each and every single one of them, Lord, that there would be no anxiety. You would remove it from them in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, that there would be a spirit of excellence upon each and every single one of them, Lord, that all they've studied, all they've learned would come back to them in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you would help them in their revising, in their preparation, oh, God. Lord, that they would sleep well every night and be refreshed every morning there to sit an exam. We thank you, Lord, that you are with them as they walk into the exam room and take their seat. Thank you, Lord, even as they pick up their pen, you are with them as they do that exam. Help them, guide them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for good success in all of our children, all of our young people taking exams at this time. We give you thanks and praise for it, O oh God. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we remember all those in the house who need healing today. All those who need your touch. All those who need healing in their body. We've heard from Judy this morning that you are the doctor of doctors. The physician of physicians. There's no case that's too big or too hard for you, O oh Lord. So right now, Lord, as it were, we just reach out and touch the hem of your garment. And thank you, Lord, for that transmission of healing power into each and every body that needs it, O oh God. Those who are watching by live stream, heal the sick right now, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, even as Susie was saying, the unbuckling. Lord, we just pray right now for that unbuckling of mental strongholds. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for healing and deliverance today, my God. Oh, we give you praise and thanks. And Lord, we do lift up the government to you once again. We just ask that you would just heal our land, oh God. Heal this land. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would remove any minister, any official that is not in accordance with your will and your purpose and not right for this nation. Remove them out of the way. Lord, raise up righteous government. Touch those who are in power, oh God. Convict those who are sinning in power. Oh Lord, that they might walk in a righteous way. We give you thanks and praise. And Lord, we do ask that you would pour out your spirit through your church in this land and pour out a revival in this nation once again, that you would turn hearts to you, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I want to thank you for every penny that comes into today's offering. Thank you, Lord, that you bless it, you multiply it, you use it for your glory, for the increase of your kingdom, for the teaching of the word of God, for the extension of your borders, the borders of your kingdom. We just thank you, Lord, and may each and every one who gives today be blessed and find their own barns, their own storehouses filled, their own cups overflowing. Thank you, Lord, for blessing today's offering. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in the courses above Join with all nature and many for the witness to thy great faith from this mercy and love. We sing, Great is thy 
the children and the youth. Praise God for their various classes. We are in a series on sharing the gospel. And uh, we're, we're digging a bit deeper, really, to, to really be equipped to share the gospel, particularly in our culture that we live in right now, which is being infested with um, an anti-God, anti-biblical worldview. And so, how do we handle that? Praise God. Well, today I want to start with a very fascinating scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. And it talks about many people who will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. We have something here called the truth, not just a truth, but the truth. And it all sounds like it's very important that you love the truth. Anyway, people who do not love the truth, who choose to reject the truth, they end up perishing. And it says, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So this says that it's essential to embrace and accept the truth in order to be saved. And for this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not just any old lie, but the lie. So there is the truth and there is the lie. Those who don't love the truth uh, come under the darkness and the delusion of the lie. That they might be condemned. So the result of embracing the lie is condemnation, is divine judgment. Uh, so this is serious business. This is the ultimate issue we're talking about, the truth and the lie. And it says, again, it defines those who are condemned as those who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the key issue is here, what is the truth? What is the lie? And it's important that we believe the truth and that we love the truth that we embrace the truth. And um, it's, this is talking about the fact that there is ultimately two beliefs. And by the way, your belief, the Bible is quite clear that your behavior and your attitudes and your behavior are a very good indication of your beliefs. Not necessarily your professed beliefs, but the c beliefs that you hold deep in your heart are revealed in the way you live. And there are ultimately two beliefs, and these two beliefs, which one you embrace, does actually govern your whole life, your whole sense of identity, 
the whole way you live your life, and ultimately your eternal destiny. And these two beliefs are the truth and the lie. And uh, as we've seen, you have to believe the truth in order to receive the gospel and be saved. And so this issue is the fundamental issue of reality. And it can only be this, the issue of origins. Where, where did this universe come from? Why does this universe exist? Why do I exist? You know, I'm sure in certain moments of your life that the awesomeness of your existence um, comes to your attention. Isn't that an amazing thing that I exist? Why is that? What caused that? That's the deepest question, the, the fundamental question. Why are we here? Number one, there is ultimately two possibilities. Is there a God who created us? Or are we and this universe just one gigantic accident that just happened? Everything follows on from that. Your sense of identity, the meaning of your life. And basically, there are only these two ways to think about yourself and about life called the truth and the life. So the truth is that there is a God who is beyond this universe. He, he is transcendent. And he created this universe. And he created each one of us. I love the truth. Uh, and this God, therefore, defines who we are. And he defines what is right and wrong. And he has the right of sovereignty and ownership over our lives. He has the right to command us, and he has the right to expect uh, our loyalty to him and our love. He defines right and wrong, and therefore we are accountable to him. One day, he will judge us. And so, he's given us free will, but don't misunderstand free will. Okay? Only God is free. Only God is absolutely free. Yes, he has given us the ability to choose which way we go in life, but it's not an absolute freedom because we are still under God's sovereignty. And one day he will hold us to account for our choices. So our freedom is not an absolute freedom. We, we will have to account to God for that freedom. It, it, that freedom is just a delegated authority. And so we will face our judge. And the Bible says it comes to everyone to die. It's appointed to die and then judgment. And, um, but we're not going to talk about the details of that today. So God, um, there is a God. That is the truth according to the Bible. The alternative and the only alternative is that this universe is all that there is. And really the alternative is atheism, which simply means there isn't a God a personal God who created us. And, um, and the, this, uh, there are two versions of this atheism. There, there's one version which the devil probably is, 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 is amazed that he could get the human race to embrace materialistic atheism, which literally says that this material universe is all that there is. All right? And we are just here by accidental processes of random things, you know, um, that, that's an incredible thing to believe because the evidence is clearly against it. Clearly, our mi even our minds are supernatural. Uh, your mind, you cannot explain your mind by random chemical processes happening in your brain. I mean, the more you think about that, the more ridiculous that is. Your mind is something super above the nature, all right? And, and you govern uh, you, you have an ability to transcend nature with your mind, all right? There's no law of, of physics that tells me that I've got to suddenly move my hand out like that, all right? What caused that? It's something that was above the laws of nature that caused that, my mind, you see? So it's clear that there is a, something more than physical matter we might call it mind or whatever. And so the other form of atheism actually is perhaps could be described as pantheism because it includes a spiritual dimension. 
you know, like New Age philosophy, for instance. So they, they still reject the idea that there's a personal God outside this universe that created this universe, but this, this universe is more than matter. It's, it's this evolving cosmic something that, that has a kind of spiritual component as well as a natural component. But it's still atheism. It's pantheism, really, that the universe is God. And, and so that's the only alternative. Either there is a God who is self-existent, who created this universe, or there is a, uh, or this universe is God, if you like. And so um, this, this universe, but the Bible says, the, the fool says that there is no God which means it's irrational. People do believe there is no God, but it's not rational. It's irrational. I mean, the ori originally, people who believed in uh, that the universe was it, all right, they felt obliged to believe that this universe is eternal, all right? Because the alternative is that somehow by magic, this universe came into existence out of nothing, and, and it, there it was. In other words, it created itself, as Stephen Hawking said, which is absolutely irrational, isn't it? it it's just kind of just magic. Oh, it just came to, to be. And, um, and so they believed in the eternal universe. However, that is now being disproved scientifically. It, it contradicts the laws of thermodynamics. It's accepted that the universe had a beginning. Many believe it was the Big Bang. Uh, I'm, as I say, I'm not going to talk about the details, but the important thing is it's generally accepted the universe had a beginning. And that clears, clearly points to the fact that Genesis 1-1 was right all the time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The alternative is that this universe was, was caused by nothing, that out of nothing came something. That's irrational. You have to have a cause. We, the whole basis of modern science is to establish what causes different things and to understand that all the causes and effects. That's one way of looking at science. And here they are saying something unscientific, something irrational, that the cause of the universe as a whole is nothing. It has no cause. It, it just happened. Again, it's, it's irrational. And so, of course, the idea here is that you have the un this universe, and then over a huge period of time, by a process of unguided evolution, everything just happens. So the, the magic word that is used to describe everything is evolution, all right? The, the, you know, the chemical evolution created the first life, and then the evolution produced from molecules to man. And um, I want to do a special on evolution, in, in this series because it so pervades our culture because it's been given as propaganda as if it's some kind of fact, some kind of, s that it's, it's science. But I remember as a boy in school, I, I didn't buy it. Uh, I wasn't a believer, but it just, <laughs> I thought this is a very tall story to expect us to, to believe that random processes by themselves could somehow create something such as awesome as, as me, you know. <laughs> you know. Well, uh, the more you study, not you too, by the way, the more you study biology and, and you know, the, the human body, you realize this is design on a, on a level that is just beyond our brain power to, to even comprehend. And the more they study even the simplest cell, uh, you know, it, it's, it, the complexity is, is immense. It's just mathematically impossible that life could happen, could originate out of nothing. It's, it's just, it doesn't make sense. And yet we're expected to buy this propaganda. But I'm going to deal with that another time. But we could characterize the truth versus the lie as creation versus evolution. Okay. And um, you either believe that there's a personal God who created all things or that you're somehow the part and product of an evolving universe. There, there, there are no alternatives to those two possibilities. If you believe the lie, then there is no meaning to life. 
All right? When you die, it's all over. And you will be forgotten. Oh, well, I'll live on in the memories of my family. They love to say that, don't they? He'll live on in our hearts. Well, they're going to die. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to be forgotten. I don't care if you're Ramesses the Great. You, you, you're going to be forgotten in the end. And no wonder a culture that promotes the lie. And the problem we have as Christians, we live, we are, as it were, a minority now, within a culture that promotes the, the lie throughout the culture. In the schools, in the media, you name it. The lie is everywhere. And if we're not aware of this, we, we need to be aware of this to protect our own hearts for a start. And this is what I'm getting to is that it's essential that we're equipped to share the gospel, to understand some of these things. Because you will be meeting people who are absolutely um, controlled by the, this lie. And that creates strongholds in their minds that blind their minds and make them incapable of understanding the gospel when you share it to them. So we have to know how to dismantle those strongholds to, so that they can hear and receive the gospel. Praise God. Well, it's not surprising, you see, a culture that promotes the lie has a tendency towards increasing despair and mental sickness and suicide. Because we're telling people, your lives are pointless. You're, you're nothing more than an animal. Uh, you're just a random fluke. Uh, your life has no meaning. You know, get what pleasure you can out of it, but basically it doesn't really matter. Well, what's to stop you commit suicide if that's your belief, you see? And, and that's one effect of the lie. And it also means that there is no God, there is no absolute moral code, there is no life after death, there is no one who is going to judge you for how you've lived your life. And so, what are you going to do? Well, I think I'm going to do whatever I want to please myself and to have as b best I can of the fleeting pleasures of life. I'm going to grab on to whatever I can. And so this, of course, a society that promotes the lie gets increasingly immoral. Paul describes this in, in Romans chapter 1. And so we live in a culture that, in a way, has rejected the Christian faith, to a de large degree, in the public sphere. And so we are seeing the downward trend that inevitably has to happen when you reject God, when you reject the truth. And so if you believe the lie, you believe that um, you've got the right to do whatever you want with your life. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, it's my life. It's my body. I'll do what I want. See, when you talk like that... That might sound, you might get a hand clap if you're on the Opera Winfrey show or whatever, all right? But that is straight from the pit of hell. That is the lie. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to God. God created you. God owns you. You are going to account to God one day. You know, the quicker you wake up to that reality and embrace that reality, the better it will be for you. Because God's a good God. Praise God. Well, the kingdom, if we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, this is the key issue in spiritual warfare. The kingdom of light is governed by the truth. In fact, there's the light, the concept of light and the concept of truth are pretty much the same. So the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God is governed by the truth. The kingdom of darkness is governed by the lie. And so the key spiritual battle over every soul starts with whether they embrace the truth or the lie. And then secondly, whether they embrace Christ or not. Only if they love the truth can they be saved through the gospel. If you think about it, if they are fully signed up to the lie, the gospel is meaningless to them. Sin? What are you talking about, sin? There is no God. There is no righteousness. There is no sin. I make up my mind what's right and wrong. So when you talk about Jesus dying for their sins, it's foolishness to them, you see. So we have to be ready to give people the truth. 
Before, sometimes, we could tell them that Jesus is the answer, we, we have to explain what the problem is. Last time, we saw that there were two ways the gospel was preached in the book of Acts. All right? First of all, in Acts 2, 3, 13, for example, when Peter or Paul was preaching to the Jews, he preached in a certain way because of the foundation had been laid. The Jews were prepared with the truth. They, they knew Genesis. We're going to say later that it's really the early chapters of Genesis that define the truth in, in this fundamental sense. And, and, and they had embraced that. So they were prepared. As it were, God had laid a foundation for the Jews to accept Christ because the, the, the gospel is the proclamation. You see, the foundation had been laid. And basically, they were saying, explain the problem creation, man fell into sin, man is under the judgment of God, but God has not given up on the human race. In fact, he's going to send a Messiah, a Savior, who is going to be a sacrifice for our sins and who is going to bring salvation to the human race. And, and that was all the foundation that had been laid. And they were looking for the Messiah. And now the gospel comes along, the perfect finishing line, as it were, to say, the Messiah Jesus has come. He has died for your sins. He's risen from the dead. And now if you turn to him and accept him, you will be saved. Hallelujah. And so the sermons to the Jews were, all, were built on the scriptures, on the Old Testament scriptures, showing how Jesus fulfilled all the scriptures because they knew the scriptures. And, and so they should have seen that Jesus fulfilled those scriptures and then accepted Jesus. Now, again, if, if you, in when this country was more Christian, you could use a similar approach because people had a basic biblical knowledge. And so you could, you could pretty much accept the fact that they understood that there's a God. They understood that there are like Ten Commandments and that they've sinned, even on a basic level, that there is a God who will judge them. And then you can preach the gospel and they will hopefully accept Praise God. But now we have, if you like, a harder situation because we now live in a culture that, that does not accept the truth. All right? So especially with younger people, unless they're brought up in strong Christian homes, they, they may not have a concept of the truth at all. But Paul had to deal with those people too because in the Greek world, except those Greeks that... that loved the truth and gathered around the Jewish synagogues, in the Greek world, they also had this kind of philosophy, atheistic type philosophy. And so when Paul came to preach to the Greeks in Athens in Acts 17, he had to take a different approach. First of all, he witnessed in the marketplace, you know, and he talked about Jesus and the resurrection. And they were thinking, well, who is this babbler? What, what, are you, what is he talking about? Um, and, and he found that it was foolishness to them. And um, that's why he says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block but, and to the Greeks foolishness. It's foolishness because their whole world view, the gospel doesn't make sense, you see. And then so he realized he had to build a foundation. So when he preached to them, and we saw this last time, so I'm not going to do that again. Um, when he preached on Mars Hill, he actually, before talking about Christ and the resurrection, he went back to the basics of the truth of God before going on to preach Christ. And sometimes when we share with people, we're going to have to do that. Because um, no longer can we be guaranteed that people have a concept of the truth because the truth has been suppressed in our culture increasingly, and the lie has been promoted. And so we're going to have to know the truth and to share the truth with people, you see. Um, this is not, however, a, a, an impossible task because the Apostle Paul had to do that in the Gentile world. And amazingly, he had greater success with the Gentiles than the Jews. <laughs> 
This is the paradox of what happened after Christ died and rose again. The Jews, who should have been the one to embrace the Messiah, who had been prepared as a whole, rejected. And yet, on the other hand, the gospel had amazing success over the last 2,000 years among the Gentiles. And they were the ones that weren't prepared. But nevertheless, when you share the truth with people, it resonates in their hearts. Because, as we're going to see, God has put the truth in every man's conscience. And God declares the truth in his creation. And the Holy Spirit is convicting them of the truth. And when you share the truth with them, something will come alive in their heart. And at that, the light will shine in their heart. And either they will choose to suppress that and reject it, or they will recognize this is true. And they will embrace the truth. You don't know, all right? You don't know who's going to embrace and who's not. So we, it's, we shouldn't really say, oh, I'm not going to share the gospel to that person because he doesn't look like. Don't judge by outward appearances. You'll be surprised who the respectable person often is the one who rejects the truth and the person least likely, you think, will be the one who embraces the truth. So we can't prejudge that. God knows who are his. And so we must know what the truth well if we're going to be effective in sharing the gospel. Let's have a look in Romans chapter 1. Let's see what the Bible says about the truth. In Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Who, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Notice there's a, a distinguishing there. And... Um, so the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but sometimes the foundation's got to be laid before they can hear the gospel. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God, and he's talking about the gospel, by the way, and, and how righteousness is revealed through the gospel. And then he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And, and some people say, Oh, that shows all the earthquakes that happen. That's the wrath of God. All right. Um, no. I believe what it's saying is, he's talking about the gospel. The wrath of God is revealed in the gospel. Part of the gospel is that God is going to judge you for your sin. The wrath of God is revealed in, throughout the Bible. It's part of the truth. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And now he describes the, the core of this unrighteousness. What causes them to be ungodly and unrighteous? who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because of our sin nature, thank you, Adam, there's, there's, because of that, man tends to suppress the truth. God has put it in every person's heart, the awareness that there is a God, but that gets suppressed because of sin, because we don't want there to be a God. We want to be our own God, thank you very much. And so man suppresses the truth of creation. They push it out of their thoughts. That's why when we witness, we're, we're doing them a big favor. We're bringing that back to light. And it says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. That tells us that God put the knowledge of God in each person. Also, Romans 2.15 says the same thing, essentially, that... Um, the work of the law is written in their heart, their conscience-bearing witness. See, in your conscience, and these two things go together, there is a knowledge of God, that there is a God. But also, there is a knowledge that there is right and wrong. Your conscience tells you certain things are right, certain things are wrong. All right? Uh, the, the lie suppresses that. But actually, people, this is so strong in people, it's very hard for them to really suppress that. Because if you say to them, is it wrong to kill someone else, like this recent Texan shooting? W was that wrong of that person? Of course it was wrong. Well, if you're going to be consistent and you believe the lie, there was nothing wrong about it at all. There is no right and wrong. Who's to say what's right? I just feel. And, and they wonder why. The schools are in a mess. And they wonder why young men act like this. Well, they've been told all their life. Their life is meaningless. 
and they can do what they like, and there is no God, there is no absolute right and wrong. So why not do what he did? There's no judge, there's no, you know. Why not go out in a, in a blaze of glory, as it were? And, and it's the product of, of the lie. And, uh, but the truth of God is in there, and the knowledge that of a moral code. If you, you can even kind of teach people about God from, from the point of morality. Do they believe there is a right and wrong? Okay, yes. Where do you get that from? What's the basis for that? If evolution is true, and if all we are is the product of random processes, and, and w what is morality? Where does that come from? It's an imaginative thing. It isn't real. There are no absolutes. And yet, deep down, people know there is an absolute right and wrong. And that you can help them see, therefore, there must be a God. You can help awaken the truth in their heart, simply from their instinctive belief in morality. And so he says, what is known of God may be is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And then he says, God has also shown it to them in creation. For since the creation of the world, verse 20, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Those people who love the lie are without an excuse. Ultimately, the issue is not intellectual, it's moral. If you embrace the lie, it's because you really are rejecting God in your heart. You don't want there to be a God. And he says the things that are made, and particularly life. When you look at life, particularly human life, when you look at the design, and now they've, sh they've shown, I don't know why, but they call it the Goldilocks universe. I, I still haven't worked out why they call it Goldilocks. Maybe I don't know Goldilocks fairy tale well enough. But th what they've proved is that this, li this universe is fine-tuned for life. When th if you study the physical laws and the physical constants, of all the essential um, things like protons and neutrons, electrons, all of those things uh, are a certain way. Now, if they were different by just, let's say, 1%, um, it, and there's a whole, you know, you could make a whole kind of list, I don't, I don't know how many they got to now, probably 100 and something, list of things that if they were slightly different, this universe might exist, but it could not support life. If the force of gravity was just ever so slightly different, then life could not happen. So it, the evidence is there that this universe is designed for life. Life is so amazing and complex, and obviously designed for a purpose, that the obvious deduction is that this universe and life is the product of a designer. It must have a cause, it must have a designer. It could not just exist and come into being by accident. It's, it's just irrational. You've got to go in the face of rationality. And the reason people do that, or they don't like to think about it, or they suck in the lie, is because deep down, that's what they want. They don't want to have to be responsible to a higher power. But when we declare the truth, Reason is on our side. And what God has put in their heart is on their side. So you, you can be powerful when you do that. Verse 21, because although they knew God, yes, they knew that there was a God. They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but become futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Notice, the effect of the lie is darkness. Spiritual darkness is in your heart is where you have embraced the lie. Professing to be wise, oh yes. They become fools. Oh, you Christians, you don't believe that stuff, do you? Oh, we're much cleverer than that nowadays. The Bible says you, you are the fool. You're the fool for rejecting God because that is irrational. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said is in his heart, there is no God. And then he explains why he does that. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. It's because of sin in the human heart. 
And it says that, that, that as a result, mankind rejected the true God and fell into idolatry. The first thing that happens when you embrace the lie is it affects your worship. Instead of worshiping the true God, you start worshiping idols. You start worshiping the things in creation. You, because you are designed to worship. And the worst of all is self-idolatry. <laughs> all right, pride. And then the result of that, verse 24, is immorality. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And then verse 25 summarizes it. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And worshipped. First of all, it affects your worship. And served. Then it affects your actions. The creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The other reason why it's, it's foolishness to embrace the lie is that God is the blessed God. That's what he says here. He's the blessed God, which basically means God is full of life. God is full of joy. God is full of blessing. He's the blessed God. He is the source of life. And when you reject God, you're rejecting life. You're embracing death. You're embracing darkness. How foolish is that? Why don't wake up to the fact that God is the truth? And then when you embrace God, you are actually embracing life. Hallelujah. And so God has, has put it in, in the men's hearts, and then he established it by his word. And particularly, the truth is given in the book of Origins, which is the book of Genesis. And really, the first chapters of the book of Genesis are the most attacked part of the Bible. And there's a reason for that, because Satan knows the foundational place that Genesis plays in somebody's faith in believing the truth versus the lie. That is the foundation that God has given of truth. And if you know the first few chapters of Genesis, you are well established in your heart and protected against the lie that is out there. And we saw in Acts 17, again, um, that's what Paul did when he preached at Mars Hill. He didn't start with Christ. He started with the Creator God. Let's quickly read that. Verse 23. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples and so forth. And so he was giving them the truth. And the problem we have today, and the, and the reason why the church in the West is, is weak, is that it's thoroughly compromised by the lie. The so-called theory, really a hypothesis of evolution, has been embraced by the mainstream churches and, and other churches, intimidated by the propaganda, really, that in the world. And, um, you know, it is said, and I'm going to deal with this in a special talk because we need to be informed about this. You know, it, I it is said, well, evolution is a fact, yeah. or even it, that it's a theory, a well-established theory or a fact. And you're told that so many times in school and so on, you're saying, well, I suppose these, these people know what they're talking about. But it's sheer propaganda. It's not fact. It's not science. It's, n you, it's never been seen to happen. You can't see it happening in the fossil record. It is just a hypothesis, and the reason that it is embraced as a hypothesis is that it's the only alternative to creation. And if you don't want to believe in creation, and what modern science does, it's rather cleverly done, naturalism is taken as a naturalistic um, basis, an assumption is we will only accept explanations that are entirely naturalistic. So we we reject creationism out of hand because it's supernatural. And that's against the rule book that we've invented <laughs> for, for, for science. So rather than following the evidence, I've been taught all about evolution. How does that fit with Genesis? You know, And, and for, for, a, for a week or two, I was quite happy with this solution that apparently 
you know, the apes evolved through this process and then eventually turned into something that looked like a man and a woman. And God said, okay, let's... And then God supernaturally gave Adam and Eve a soul, a, a spirit, and made them human. So he took the pre-existing bodies of these evolved apes and added a soul to them. And that way they could kind of hold together. But, um, but, and so you have theistic evolution. Uh, it, eventually I had to reject that. Because that's just not there in the Bible. you know. And it also creates a major problem about the character of God. It's really blaspheming against God. Because it is saying that God is cruel. Because the process of evolution, of survival of the fittest, of millions and millions of violent deaths being committed continually in the animal kingdom over millions and millions of years. This was God's design. And God used that process to eventually bring forth the human body. First of all, what does that say about the efficiency of God? My God says, God said and it was done. He created each kind of animal and human beings by direct creation. And then they could multiply and so forth. Um, it's totally anti-biblical. But the, the church as a whole has swallowed it. And yet, if you can't believe the Bible at its most fundamental level uh, of origins, if you can't believe that God could just create this universe that he and this life in its forms, and you, you can't believe that, and you embrace the lie at that level, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I'm just saying you are thoroughly compromised in your faith because you don't even believe the Bible. How can you believe the rest of the Bible if you even doubt the opening chapter of the Bible? The, it, you, it, the church has become compromised by the lie. That is one problem. So Genesis 1, um, very, very quick summary here of the truth because I know we're doing, we're doing good. Um, Genesis 1 is clear, of course. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created all the different kinds of life forms directly. And finally, God created man in his image. All right? That is truth 101. Okay? Then in Genesis 2 is the direct creation of Adam and Eve, not by evolution, in the image of God, not in the image of apes. Reminds me of a story of a of a lady who, um, she had a daughter, 10-year-old daughter, who came to her and said, Mommy, I'm really confused. You are telling me that I am special, that I am created in the image of God. But Daddy says that we're just evolved monkeys. We're descended from monkeys and apes. You know, how, how can we bring these two things? What's true, you know? She, oh, and sh she says, oh, darling, that's, that's simple. I was talking about my side of the family. Your father was talking about his side of the family. <laughs> well, then in Genesis 3, of course, we have Adam sinned. Here we have the origin of sin. And because we're all in Adam, because we're all descended from Adam, he brought the whole human race into sin. And you see that in Genesis 4, 5, 6, 7. Wickedness covering the earth. From that original sin of Adam, sin developed across the whole world. Even the ev evangelical world, parts of it, is being infiltrated by the, by the lie. And, beginning, and one major sign of that is that they deny the, 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 that there was a real Adam. As soon as you deny that, you're denying the gospel. But anyway, um, so it wasn't the other way around that there was death, sin and death, was actually what God used to create the human being. The Bible says, no, that's the opposite way, because that's a slur on the character of God. By the way, the main argument against God is how come, if there's a good, powerful God, that there's so much suffering and evil in this world? If you embrace theistic evolution, you're making that worse, because you're saying God designed it that way. But if you take the biblical position, the truth, then sin and death and suffering and all of it 
come in, not by God's design, but because man chose to rebel against God. Genesis 3 defines what sin is. It's not you slipping up occasionally. Sin is rebellion against God. And because Adam sinned and because we're in Adam, we were born sinners. Sin isn't just a superficial thing that we mess up sometimes. Sin is radically infected our nature. And, and we are sinners at our root. We are rebels against God. And now, when you hear the gospel, that is some seriously good news, that God has an answer for that. But if you just think you're basically good because you believe the lie, I'm basically good and I'm, you know, yes, I mess up sometimes, no big deal. If that's your attitude, there's a bit of the lie is still in your heart. When you understand what sin is, it's rebellion against the most high and most holy God. Then you realize the value of the blood of Jesus. And, and so, what he, you know, I, I don't have time to expand it. But basically, Genesis 3 tells us that sin, rebellion against God, began when Adam turned against God. And that is the cause of the evil and the suffering in this world. And, but it also, we are infected with that thing. The whole human race is infected. And we, that is seen in the next chapter when Cain kills Abel, murders Abel. And wickedness covers the earth. And then we see God judge that in Noah's flood. That's all part of the truth, that there is such a thing as sin and that God will judge that sin. See, And therefore, that gives you the worldview that is called the, the truth. And um, when you have that, that view, I'll expand on this next time because I'm run out of time. But um, I wanted to show you the truth and the origin of the lie in Genesis chapter 3. How the lie came into the human race when Satan said, ah, God won't really judge you. You won't really die, you know. Um, and then he says, you could be like God. I'll talk about what that means. But basically the lie is, God, you, God, you, can, you can evolve into Godhood. God, Elohim is holding you back. Embrace your independence from Elohim and you will discover your full potential. And so it's, it's the lie. And Adam makes, swallows it whole. It's made to look attractive. And he swallows it whole. And as a result, death and curse come on the human race just as he, um, as God warned it would. And, but the same issue faces each one of us, each human being. The devil is allowed to promote the lie. God is promoting the truth through his Holy Spirit, through his ambassadors such as yourself. And every person is confronted with the choice that Adam and Eve had. Are you going to love the truth or are you going to embrace, uh, are you going to embrace the lie? One will lead to life, the other will lead to destruction. But I want to develop this in next time I share in this series because I do believe we need to know Genesis well and we need to know the truth well and we need to be able to, to share uh, in that. The interesting thing is, well, you might think, well, on, you know, the major monotheistic religions, surely they have the truth. That is true to a degree, but both Judaism in its present form and Islam, they do accept that there is a creator God who will judge us, but they have re rejected what is revealed about sin and the need for salvation and the need of a sacrifice for salvation. You see, part of the truth, part of the preparation in Genesis 3 is that God revealed that he had an answer to this problem. He revealed that there would be a coming Messiah who would be born of a virgin, the seed of the woman, and he would crush the devil under his feet, and he would rescue mankind from the clutches of sin. And he even showed that how it would be done, that though the wages of sin is death, as he had warned, yet he killed in Genesis 3 an innocent animal 
and clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of that animal. They were clothed with blood. And what God was teaching them there is the wages of sin is death, but God is going to make a provision of an innocent substitute. Somebody can take our place and suffer the death that we deserve. And if you accept that death for you, you can be clothed in his righteousness, covered by his blood, and you can have salvation. And God instituted the sacrificial system throughout the Old Testament there to teach this very lesson that th there is coming a deliverer who is going to die for your sins. Take the penalty for your sins. Hallelujah. And now we know who that is. His name is Jesus. Praise God. He's the fulfillment of everything. But the truth in Genesis is the foundation. If we don't understand the truth, we, we are not really equipped. Well, we need to know it for ourselves, by the way. Because if, if, if we don't know the foundation in Genesis, when the world assaults us with its viewpoints, a house that isn't built on a foundation is very weak. When the storm comes, it's going to collapse. So I, I want to spend a bit more time building that foundation that you know the Word of God. And you, you know, but also it's important in sharing the gospel that you have a strong hand on the truth and you can share when you can see somebody isn't hearing you because they don't have a concept of the truth. You, you know what to share with them. Praise God. I'm going to finish with this scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, verse 3. It is veiled to those who are perishing, in which case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What's blinding their minds is the wrong beliefs called the lie. Then he, he picks this up in 2 Corinthians 10.3, describing uh, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, we are in a spiritual battle. We're God's soldiers in this battle. For the weapons of our warfare, and our main weapon is the truth, the Word of God. Our weapons are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds, of fortresses. What are these fortresses, Paul? What are these strongholds that the enemy has established in their hearts and minds? We are destroying arguments, logismus, reasonings, wrong convictions. They have to be destroyed. We have to destroy the lie. We've got to have the lie destroyed in our own heart, but also we've got to know how to destroy the lie. Destroying arguments, reasonings, and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Praise God. We need to recognize the truth and the lie and be on our guard because it's everywhere. The lie is everywhere in our culture. And we have to protect our heart against it and our children. And also we need to fight for the truth. Praise God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Lord, thank you for the truth. We love the truth. Hallelujah. We're going to finish with Holy Communion in a second. Lord, we just choose to embrace the truth. Thank you for shining your truth upon us. We turn to the light, Lord. We embrace the truth. And we reject the lie, the evil lie, that we belong to ourselves, that we made ourselves somehow, that we're our own God. Oh, self-idolatry. Oh, God, we hate that lie. We hate that darkness. Oh, God, we love the fact that you made us. You made us in a special way with special gifts. And we rejoice in who you have made us. And we give our loyalty to you, O oh God. We thank you for making us strong in the truth, O oh God, and empowering us to demolish the strongholds of the lie. Lord, in the people we meet, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord.
As we come to the table of the Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord, for fulfilling all the prophecies and all the promises from the beginning. You are that promised Messiah, the only one who can save us from sin and eternal death. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you were raised from the dead to prove you had won the victory, and you will raise us all from the death and give us a glorious eternity oh thank you for loving us lord even when we were your enemies rebels oh god even for the times lord that we embrace the lie but lord, thank you lord for bringing us to the light showing us the truth showing us jesus blessing us with your life your everlasting life Lord, we thank you. We bless these elements 
that represent to us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that as we eat of the bread, we believe we receive our healing. As we drink of the blood, we thank you for our forgiveness through the blood of Jesus and the cleansing from every stain of sin in our soul. Lord, cleanse us supernaturally, we pray, even as we eat and we drink. We proclaim our faith in you, that we're trusting in you alone. Amen. Praise God. Well, you probably know how these things work. Do um, eat the, the wafer as it's passed around. Hold on to the cup. We'll all drink together after this song. The Lord says that, that uh, in Corinthians, do not eat or drink unworthily. And it really means with a kind of um, unthinking attitude, like this is some unimportant thing. What it means is we, this is a sacred moment. As you drink, it's not you just drinking. 
some juice. But it's you declaring that you are putting all your trust, not 50% of your trust, covering your bases as it were, or 95% of your trust. You are putting all your trust in Jesus Christ and his blood. You acknowledge that you're a sinner. Without him, you're a sinner. And that you need his blood for your eternal salvation, for your forgiveness. You have no standing before God apart from the work of Christ, the blood of Christ. And you are putting all your trust in him for your righteousness, for your salvation, for your life. So let us drink and let us say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your precious blood. I belong to you. I am purchased by your blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Let, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Praise God forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes you just got to shout it out. Praise God. Well, God bless you. Have a blessed week. And share the truth whenever you get the chance. Amen.